Good evening. So tonight is not, as some people have already come up to me to say, a debate between pro-war and anti-war. Okay? Uh, I'm not pro-war. We're both anti-war, but we're anti-war in a different way. I say that war can be justifiable in certain circumstances, and as a pacifist, he says war is never justifiable. Right? But don't think that I am pro-war. I've had five of my students killed, you know, friends killed. Uh, I've seen too much of war, a lot of innocent people. War, war is not good, but in a certain situation, it is the right thing to do, and that's the argument I'm going to make tonight. War is a crime. Every time there's a war, there is someone who's done something really bad, usually a political leadership, who is imposing violence on some other political community. But just because it's a crime doesn't mean that no one should be involved, right? If someone comes up to you when you're walking home tonight and attempts to murder you, they are a criminal, you are a victim, and you have every right to fight back. If someone comes up and tries to rape you, they are a criminal, but in the name of peace, you don't have to put up with it. You can fight back. We have human rights, and the argument I'm going to make tonight is that based on our human rights, which give rise to our communal rights, we have rights also to defend ourselves against other countries. So war is justifiable when your political community, your country, has been attacked by an aggressor nation. I'll do this, you know, the, the way the argument will progress is first, well, let me tell you quickly about kind of how I got into this position. I grew up probably pretty much on the militarist side of things, right? So there's three broad groups, militarists who think war is kind of a good thing, a noble thing, mostly about national interests, they're not worried about ethics. Then you have pacifists who say war is a horrible thing, we should never do it. And then you have the middle ground, which I'm arguing for, which is saying war can be justifiable if you're on the defending side. Right? So the way I'm going to argue it, since most people haven't been to war, right, and it's hard to imagine it, and maybe we have misconceptions based on movies and whatnot, um, I'm going to argue how our individual rights, that our right to self-defense, which we understand intuitively, to the right of, to be defended by police, and I've never met a pacifist who rejects police protection, so they do believe in some use of force, to protect the innocent. And then the big jump, which is, do those same principles that justify our use of a police force apply in war? Right? So kind of a three-part argument. So first, the starting point, we always, every argument has to have a starting point everyone can agree with. Everyone has the right not to be killed. By virtue of our human dignity, we have the rights, well, we say life and liberty. That's what our Declaration of Independence said. Endowed by our Creator with una unalienable rights to life and liberty. That's actually not precise, because we don't have a right to life. We're all going to die, right? And mostly, most time, no one's violated our rights. We do have a right that another human being not kill us. We do have a right that another human being not enslave us. Our right to free speech is the right that someone doesn't prevent us, coerce us from being able to speak our minds. So these core rights we all agree with, these are negative rights. These are claims against another person that says, you can't do something to me. There are, are other kinds of rights, positive rights. You have the right to health care. You have the right to income, right? You have the right to certain things. Those are much more disputed because now you're saying not that someone should leave you alone. You're saying someone owes you something. But our country is based on, and the notion of human rights, Traditionally, on these negative rights, the right not to be killed, not to be enslaved, the right to bodily in integrity. We all, so every human being has those by virtue of being a human being. But we also know that we can forfeit our rights. There's more than a million Americans in jail right now because they did something that forfeited their right to live freely in society. If you're walking home and someone attacks you violently, right, you know that you, you just naturally know through natural law, you have the right to fight back. You'd almost be disregarding yourself if you didn't. And it's because a, everyone has a right, but we can forfeit our right. And when a human being threatens another human being who still possesses their right, that threatener forfeits their own right for the time during which they're a threat. And that's why if someone comes at you, you can fight back. 
And that's why other passerbys can come and help save you and do violence to that person because that person has forfeited their right not to be harmed because they're harming someone else. And it's, we always want to think about it. The person who is creating that threat and that harm is the person during that time who forfeits their own right. Now, the other people, think about it. They don't have to stop and help you because their rights aren't being threatened. But they do it out of love for a fellow human being. Right? I think almost everything in morality can be understood by three big principles. Respect other people. Respect their human dignity. Support the common good and love one another, right? which is a more positive duty. So when those others come to help you, think how grateful you would be that through their love, they stopped you from being harmed, your most you know, important rights from being harmed. So that is just the way things work in everyday life. And we do it even if the attacker is not fully responsible. Even if someone who's drunk comes at you, even if someone's high on drugs, Right? And goes and attacks some lady and starts just stabbing her. And sometimes random things happen. We don't understand why it happens. And even we know that person's not responsible. But we know we have a duty to the victim to help that victim. Because that victim's rights are being violated, even if we know that the attacker isn't fully responsible. So that's our own individual life. We can make sense of that. Now think about a police force. Right? The police are people who say... We're not worried about just what comes to us, anyone attacking us or attacking our family or something we see. Our job is to try to prevent this behavior and to stop this behavior when we see it. And in general, you know, the police do a really good job. The police protect us from threats inside of our political community. And they're well-trained, and they have other assets that allow them to stop the threat in, in the most minimally damaging way, right? Because if all you have is a gun and someone attacks you, well, all you have is a gun. And or if all you have is your hands, whatever it is, the police, because they have training with their hands, because they have clubs, because they have tasers, they can use an escalation of force to try to stop the threat. As soon as that threat is stopped, right, then that, that person who was posing the threat regains their full rights. So think about it this way. Think of a bank robbery, right? If you have bank tellers, you got police officers, I'm going to tell a quick story here, you have the, the bank robber. That morning when they wake up, they all fully have the right not to be harmed by another human being, not to be killed. When that bank robber makes the terrible decision to get a loaded weapon, to go in there, to rob the bank, he comes in there, shoots one teller, turns to the other teller, says, give me the money, gets money. When that bank robber is coming out, if police come up there, right? When that, the, the police officer knows he's just killed one person coming out armed. Can the police officer legally use force against that person to stop the threat? Yes, they can, right? Why? Because that person is still a threat. You know the person's intent. They've already killed one person. You know their capability. They're still armed. And those are the two things to think about in terms of... Um, what the law, and based on morality, I think very well, says about when we can ever do harm to another person. Someone forfeits their right when they have the intent to do harm, the capability to do harm, and when the harm is imminent. Right? They can't be running away saying, I'm going to come back and get you later. It would be wrong to shoot them in the back. Right? Um, and so that's why for that police officer, if that police officer puts the gun on the criminal and the criminal puts up their hands, the police officer should not shoot. That's a statement that their intent is no longer threatening. So they, of course, they say drop the weapon, right? Because then when someone doesn't have a capability to do harm, um, you know, they're no longer a threat, and they regain their right not to be killed. We see the same thing in war at the individual level. Soldiers should never kill. As soon as an enemy soldier surrenders or an enemy soldier is wounded and incapacitated, it would be morally wrong to kill them. They're no longer a threat, and they regain their right uh, to, to life. They re regain their right not to be killed. Now, I'm guessing that my um, colleague here, my pastor's colleague, is agreeing with the right not to be killed. You, you'll let me know. At an individual level and the police officer level, and they say war isn't like that. Because war is, think about it, 
You know, I've been to war deployed five times. I didn't start the war. The people on the other side didn't start the war. Pacifists a lot of times will say, you're innocent attackers. You're both innocent of the war. You shouldn't be harming each other. But actually, that is, and so, and especially in war, you shoot people when they're not directly threatening you. In fact, we try to kill the enemy combatants before they have the chance to do harm to us and threaten us. So that seems fundamentally different than what the police do. Police use force as the last resort. Yet in war, we tend to use force, the maximum force allowable, as soon as we can to seize the initiative right, on the enemy. So how, how can you say it's an imminent threat to you? And here's the conceptual jump that's important to understand. Anytime you see a military uniform, notice this. You always have the person's name, because they're fighting as an individual. They're making their own moral choices out there on the battlefield. But they're also, the only reason they're there is because they're fighting for this political community. It'll say U.S. Army or U.S. Navy. A war isn't between individuals. It's not between Pete and Muhammad or anyone else. Right? The war is between our political communities. So in individual life, when if someone's coming at you, you should try to talk them out of it. You should try to avoid the situation. You should say, come on, dude, this is not smart. Let's not go this way. When it comes to war, that is a country saying, hey, you're threatening us. Let's try economic sanctions. Let's try diplomacy. There's got to be another way to do it. Any just war should be, by just war theory, a war of last resort. A just war is a necessary war. But it's a war that if you cede, if you just give up, you can't do anything more. And we always have the right to fight to defend our political community. When Germany attacked Poland, 1939, the Polish had the right to fight to try to defend their political community. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, the Kuwaitis had a right to fight back to defend their political community, just like individuals have that right. So because a war is between these political communities, that's why you don't have to wait. I have to talk to soldiers about this. You don't have to be personally threatened. The war is between us and Al Qaeda. Okay, we, the, the chance for talking about peace is gone. The fight is on. When you get the chance, you should kill the enemy combatants, as long as they're still combatants. Take that back to the individual case. If someone attacks you when you're walking home tonight with a knife, and you're down on the ground, and that knife is coming towards your eyeball, right? it would be stupid for your knee to say, well, I'm not personally threatened. I'm not going to knee him in the groin. right? No, because we're all one body, and our body has to work together. If any of us is threatened, all of us is threatened, we should all work together to end the threat. And that's how it is in war. Our political community, judged by our political leaders, they've said, we are so threatened that we have to fight. The other options aren't working. The military is the fist of the body politic. The whole rest of the body is going to suffer and die unless you fight. And that's what we do. Just like our fist does it for our own body if you get attacked tonight, the military does it for our own political community. Now, I wish... The, right, the proper role in this political body is for the head to be very deliberative. And the head is our political leadership. And they should be trying to find any other way to fight. Right? And the military, our role is to win the war if our political leadership, elected by all of us, says that that's what we have to do. How am I on time? Oh, good. And so um, what we need, the thing that's missing right now, I think within our polity is the civilian leadership and the civilian people understanding when war is just and saying we're only going to go to war when war is just. Ironically, what we have in America right now, and thank God we have Secretary Mattis and General McMaster and other people up there, right? we tend to have civilians like, let's go kick their ass, right? And the military says, stop. We have other elements of national policy, right? We have economic, we have informational, we have um, diplomatic, right? Let's use those other tools. But still, I mean, I have the easy role in this argument. All I have to say is, can war be justifiable? Of course. When you are attacked, to defend yourself is justifiable. That can be a mental leap for us because no one's going to attack the United States anytime soon. 
we're pretty big, we're powerful, and we're protected by oceans. But I guarantee you that if United States forces were not physically present and willing to fight to defend Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, probably even Poland, Western Ukraine, Georgia, the parts that Russia hasn't already invaded, Russia would be using force to take those over. And sometimes it doesn't make sense to us. Like, why would they do that? Why don't we all just get along? Yeah, why don't we all just get along? Why do we have a police officer here tonight? Because for whatever reason, there is a problem of evil in the world. And as much as 98% of us would just love to get along, there's always a minority of people throughout history, in all times, in all places, in all cultures, who won't just get along, who will violate the rights of others, violate the property rights, violate the right, right, rights. You know, I've seen, I've been in Iraq where it's lawless, where there was law, lawlessness in 2003, when the government fell. And hey, this is your chance to all get along. This horrible dictator that was so bad to you is gone. And what did people do? They were just killing each other, right? There was massive theft. There was widespread rape. Why? Right? You can't answer that. At the individual level, you can't answer, why do I have to lock my car? Why do I have to lock my doors? Why do I have to have police? Why, why do people do bad things? Why are so many people subject to sexual harassment and sexual assault? Because some human beings will do bad things. And that's at the individual level, that's at the societal level, that's at the international level. And as long as you have evil in the world, you have to have some people who are willing to fight to defend against that evil. There's a guy, Dave Grossman, wrote some very good books called On Killing and On Combat. And he used an analogy I thought was pretty interesting. He said, 98% of the world are sheep. They just want to get along and be good to each other and enjoy their lives. A very small percentage, probably less than 1%, are wolves. And it doesn't take many wolves to ruin the lives of the sheep. They're never secure, right? And maybe even some other sheep are going to join the wolves if, hey, if the wolves are going to get everything they want and be in control, right? So that's how evil spreads. But he said they're sheepdogs. And sheepdogs sometimes get on the nerves of the sheep, but they never harm them. And the sheepdogs will give their lives to stop the wolves. And the, our police officer against internal threats our military against external threats are those sheepdogs. So I'll see you the rest of my time. Thank you for your attention. Three minutes for your response. Thank you for that uh, terrific opening, and thank you all for being here, and thank you, Glenn, for hosting this. Um, what we most heard was, what we just heard was mostly theoretical about unnamed wars. I, I would have expected a long list of examples of the wars that have been justifiable. We heard Poland, and we heard the Gulf War. Uh, last resorts, nothing else could have been done. They were just and humane and good wars. Iraq, before the Gulf War, was willing to negotiate a peaceful settlement. It proposed that Israel also withdraw from the Palestinian territories while Iraq withdrew from Kuwait. It proposed uh, a weapon, weapons of mass destruction free zone for the Middle East. How horrible such things would have been. And many governments of the world encouraged pursuing those negotiations. The United States preference was for war. There is no such thing as war as a last resort. There is going out of your way to avoid peace. And as if we can talk about actual examples of wars, I would love to hear some examples of the ones that have been justified and of the ones that haven't been justified. And I would love to know how you quantify the difference, how you determine the good that's supposedly accomplished and how many deaths uh, are justified by that good. I would like to know how to quantify that. Uh, Pete wrote in the Washington Post in 2006 that people were blind to all the good that U.S. soldiers were doing and the war was doing for Iraq, a nation absolutely destroyed by that war. I want to know what that good was. What, regardless of whether the, the good outweighed the bad and the war was justified or not, I'd like to know that too. But what in the world was that good? Uh, the idea that wars 
are somehow self-defense and that this justifies wars. I mean, that argument has to go both ways. Both sides can claim it. But if only one side gets to claim it, well, it's not this one. It's Iraq. It's Afghanistan. It's Vietnam. It's the places attacked that can more plausibly make that claim. But it doesn't justify making war. Uh, it, you know, and justifying a soldier's actions within a war doesn't justify the decision to initiate a war. Uh, and, and a soldier is not a civilian with the right to self-defense, you know, a right that does not come because somebody else has forfeited their right. It comes most plausibly because it's actually a last resort, they, and, and because they have tried nonviolent approaches, which in an individual case can run out. It's not a good analogy to a war, because the same does not apply. In war, most of the killing historically has happened while the other soldiers are retreating, including killing some 30,000 Iraqis in that good war, in that justifiable war, the Gulf War. 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> following an illegal order is not legal. Uh, a, 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 an Iraqi village is not a threat to a drone pilot, and Iraq was never a threat to the United States. These are not facts. I'll try to answer all your questions. Some just war, wars. World War II, the I-4 intervention in Bosnia. If, you don't, if you're not familiar with Srebrenica, look it up. Right? When UN troops were not willing to fight, 9,000 men got slaughtered. When the United States came in, the slaughter ended. We waited five years, and 300,000 people had to die before we ended the slaughter by going in there with military force, and the people will be forever grateful to us there in Bosnia, Herzegovina. Afghanistan, OIF-1, you know, they, all they had to do is turn over al-Qaeda. They decided to put in their, their bit with them a foreign government that sponsors people who have declared war on you and are killing your citizens has forfeited its right as a government, not the people. Um, bad wars, Grenada, bad war, Panama, bad war, um, 80s, I guess, wasn't a good decade. So everything I say in this quick overview is going to raise more questions than it answers, many of which I have tried to answer at length in books, uh, and much of which is documented at davidswanson.org, including much about World War II and Bosnia. Let's begin with the fact that war is optional. It is not dictated to us by genes or outside forces. To the extent that people mostly shouting at each other and waving sticks and swords can be called the same thing as a person sitting at a desk with a joystick sending missiles into villages halfway around the world, this thing called war has been far more absent than present in human existence. Many societies have done without it. The notion that war is natural is frankly ridiculous. A great deal of conditioning is needed to prepare most people to take part in war, and a great deal of mental suffering, including higher suicide rates, is common among those who have taken part. In contrast, not a single person is known to have suffered deep moral regret or post-traumatic stress disorder from war deprivation. War does not correlate with population density or resource shortages. It is quite simply most used by those societies most accepting of it. The United States is high on and in some ways dominates the top of that list. Surveys have found the U.S. public among wealthy nations the most supportive of, quote, preemptively attacking other countries. Polls have also found that in the U.S., 44% of people claim they would fight in a war for their country, while in many other countries with equal or higher standard of living, that response is under 20%. U.S. culture is saturated with militarism, and the U.S. government is uniquely devoted to it, spending almost the same as the rest of the world combined, despite most of the other big spenders being close allies whom the U.S. pushes to spend more. In fact, every other nation on Earth spends closer to the zero dollars spent by Costa Rica or Iceland than to the one trillion dollars spent by the United States. The U.S. maintains some 800 bases in other people's countries, while all other nations on Earth combined maintain a few dozen foreign bases. Since World War II, the U.S. has killed or helped kill some 20 million people, overthrown at least 
36 governments, interfered in at least 84 foreign elections, attempted to assassinate over 50 foreign leaders, dropped bombs on people in over 30 countries. For the past 16 years, the U.S. has been systematically damaging a region of the globe, bombing Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Libya, Somalia, Yemen, and Syria. The U.S. has so-called special forces in two-thirds of the countries on Earth. When I watch a basketball game on TV, two things are almost guaranteed. UVA will win, and the announcers will thank the U.S. troops for watching from 175 countries. That's uniquely American. In 2016, a presidential primary debate question was, would you be willing to kill hundreds and thousands of innocent children? That doesn't happen in election debates in other countries where the other 96% of humanity lives. U.S. foreign policy journals discuss whether to attack North Korea or Iran. That's uniquely American. The publics of most countries polled in 2013 by Gallup called the U.S. the greatest threat to peace in the world. Pew found that viewpoint increased in 2017. So this country has an unusually strong investment in war, though it is far from the only war maker. But what would it take to have a justifiable war? According to just war theory, a war must meet several criteria, which I find fall into these three categories, the non-empirical, the amoral, and the impossible. By non-empirical, I mean things like right intention, a just cause, and proportionality. When your government says, that blowing up a building where ISIS has stored money justifies killing up to 50 people. There is no agreed upon empirical test to go out there and reply, no, it's only 49, or it's six, or it's 4,097 people can be justly killed. Attaching some just cause to a war, such as ending slavery, never explains all the actual causes of a war and does nothing to justify the war. During a time when much of the globe ended slavery and serfdom without a war, Claiming that as a cause for a war carries no weight. By amoral criteria, I mean things like being publicly declared and being waged by legitimate and competent authorities. These are not moral concerns. Even in a world where we actually had competent uh, and legitimate authorities, they wouldn't make a war any more or less just. Does anyone really picture a family in Yemen hiding from a constantly buzzing drone being thankful that it's been sent to them by a competent and legitimate authority. By impossible, I mean things like be a last resort, have a reasonable prospect of success, keep non-combatants immune from attack, respect enemy soldiers as human beings, treat prisoners of war as non-combatants. To call something a last resort is in reality merely to claim it is the best idea you have, not the only idea you have. There are always other ideas that anyone can think of, even if you're in the role of the Afghans or the Iraqis actually being attacked. Studies like those of Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan have found nonviolent resistance to domestic and even foreign tyranny to be twice as likely to succeed and those successes to be far longer lasting. We can look to successes, some partial, some complete, against foreign invasions over the years, Nazi-occupied Denmark and Norway, in India, in Palestine, Western Sahara, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, etc., and many dozens of successes against regimes that in many cases have had foreign support. My hope is that the more that people learn the tools of nonviolence and their power, the more they will believe in and choose to make use of that power, which will increase the power of nonviolence in a virtuous cycle. At some point, I can imagine people laughing at the idea that some foreign dictatorship is going to invade and occupy a nation 10 times its size, full of people dedicated to nonviolent, non-cooperation with occupiers. Already, I get a bit of a laugh on a frequent basis when people email me with the threat that if I do not support war, I had better be prepared to start speaking North Korean, or what they call the ISIS language. Apart from the non-existence of these languages, the idea that anybody is going to get 300 million Americans to learn any foreign language, much less do so at gunpoint, almost makes me cry. I can't help imagining how much weaker war propaganda might be if everybody did speak multiple languages. But continuing with the impossible criteria, what about respecting a person while trying to kill her or him? There are lots of ways to respect a person but none of them exist simultaneously with trying to kill that person. In fact, I would rank right at the bottom of people who respect me, people who are trying to kill me. 
Remember, Just War Theory was created by people who believed that killing someone was doing them a favor. And non-combatants are the majority of casualties in modern wars, overwhelmingly, so they cannot be kept safe. And there is no reasonable prospect of success available. The US military is on an enormous, record-breaking losing streak. But the biggest reason that no war can ever be justified is not that no war can ever meet all the criteria of just war theory, but rather that war is not an incident. It is an institution. Many people in the US will concede that many US wars have been unjust, but claim justness for World War II or Bosnia or a couple others. Others claim no just wars yet, but join the masses in supposing that there might be a justifiable war someday. It is that supposition, far more than any wars, that kill people. The US government spends over a trillion dollars on war and war preparations each year, while 3% of that could end starvation, and 1% of it end the lack of clean drinking water globally. The military budget is the only place with the resources needed to try to save the Earth's climate. Far more lives are lost and damaged through the failure to spend money well than through the violence of war and more are lost or put at risk through side effects of that violence than directly. War and war preparations are the biggest destroyer of the natural environment. Most countries on Earth burn less fossil fuels than does the US military. Most Superfund disaster sites even in this country are at military bases. The institution of war is the biggest eroder of our liberties, even when the wars are marketed under the word freedom. This institution impoverishes us threatens the rule of law, degrades our culture by fueling violence, bigotry, the militarization of police and mass surveillance. This institution puts us all at risk of nuclear disaster and it endangers rather than protects those societies that engage in it. According to the Washington Post, President Trump asked Secretary of so-called Defense James Mattis why he should send troops to Afghanistan and Mattis said to prevent a bomb in Times Square. Yet the man who tried to set off a bomb in Times Square seven years ago said it was to get the US troops out of Afghanistan. For North Korea to try to occupy the United States would require a force many times larger than the North Korean military. For North Korea to attack the United States, were it actually capable, would be suicide. Could it happen? Well, look at what the CIA said before the US attacked Iraq. Iraq would be most likely to use its weapons only if attacked. Apart from the non-existence of those weapons, that was accurate. Terrorism has predictably increased during the war on terrorism as measured by the Global Terrorism Index. 99.5% of terrorist attacks occur in countries engaged in wars and or abuses such as imprisonment without trial, torture, or lawless killing. The highest rates of terrorism are in so-called liberated and democratized Iraq and Afghanistan. The terrorist groups responsible for the most terrorism, that is non-state, politically motivated violence, around the world have grown out of US wars against terrorism. Those wars themselves have caused numerous just retired top US government officials and a few US government reports to describe military violence as counterproductive, as creating more enemies than are killed. 95% of all suicide terrorist attacks are conducted to encourage foreign occupiers to get out of the terrorist's home country. And an FBI study in 2012 said that anger over US military operations abroad was the most commonly cited motivation for individuals involved in cases of so-called homegrown terrorism in the US. These facts lead me to three conclusions. One, Foreign terrorism in the United States could be virtually eliminated by keeping the US military out of any country that is not the United States. Two, if Canada wanted anti-Canadian terrorist networks on a US scale or just wanted to get threatened by North Korea, it would need to radically increase its bombings, occupying, and base construction around the world. Three, on the model of the war on terrorism, the war on drugs that produces more drugs, the war on poverty that seems to increase poverty, we would be wise to consider launching a war on sustainable prosperity and happiness. For a war on North Korea to be justifiable, for example, the US would have to have not gone to such efforts over the years to avoid peace and provoke conflict. 
It would have to be innocently attacked. It would have to lose the ability to think so that no alternatives could be considered. It would have to redefine success to include a scenario in which a nuclear winter might cause much of the Earth to lose the ability to grow crops or eat. By the way, Keith Payne, a drafter of the new Nuclear Posture Review back in 1980, parodying Dr. Strangelove, defined success to allow 20 million Americans dead and unlimited non-Americans dead. It would also have to invent bombs that spare non-combatants. It would have to devise a means of respecting people while killing them. And in addition, this remarkable war would have to do so much good as to outweigh all the damage done by decades of preparing for such a war, all the economic damage, political damage, damage to the Earth's land, water, and climate, all the deaths by starvation and disease that could have been so easily spared, plus all the horrors of all the unjust wars that were facilitated by the preparations for the dreamed of just war, plus the risk of nuclear apocalypse created by the institution of war. No war can meet such standards. So-called humanitarian wars, which is what Hitler called his invasion of Poland and NATO called its invasion of Libya, do not, of course, measure up to just war theory, but neither do they benefit humanity. What the US and Saudi militaries are doing to Yemen is the worst humanitarian disaster in years. The US sells or gives weapons to 73% of the world's dictators and gives military training to many of them. Studies have found that there is no correlation between the severity of human rights abuses in a country and the likelihood of Western invasion of that country. But other studies have found that oil importing countries are 100 times more likely to intervene in civil wars of oil exporting countries. And in fact, the more oil a country produces or owns, the higher the likelihood of third party interventions. The US, like any other war maker, has to work hard to avoid peace. The US has spent years rejecting out of hand peace negotiations for Syria. In 2011, so that NATO could begin bombing Libya, the African Union was prevented by NATO from presenting a peace plan to Libya. In 2003, Iraq was open to unlimited inspections or even the departure of its president, according to numerous sources, including the president of Spain, who, to whom US President Bush recounted Hussein's offer to leave. In 2001, Afghanistan was open to turning Osama bin Laden over to a third country for trial. In 1999, the US State Department deliberately set the bar too high, according to members of the US State Department, insisting on NATO's right to occupy all of Yugoslavia so that Serbia wouldn't agree and would therefore supposedly need to be bombed. Go back through history. The United States sabotaged peace proposals for Vietnam. The Soviet Union proposed peace negotiations before the Korean War. Spain wanted the sinking of the USS Maine to go to international arbitration before the Spanish-American War. Mexico was willing to negotiate the sale of its northern half. In each case, the US preferred war. Peace would not seem so difficult if people stopped going to such efforts to avoid it. Like like Mike Pence in a room with a woman from North Korea trying not to indicate awareness of her presence. And if we stopped letting them scare us, fear can make lies and simplistic thinking believable. We need courage. We need to lose this fantasy of total safety that drives us to create ever greater danger. And if the United States had a democracy rather than bombing people in the name of democracy, I wouldn't have to convince you all of a thing. The US public already favors military reductions and greater use of diplomacy. Such moves would stimulate a reverse arms race, and that would open more eyes to the possibility of advancing further in that direction, the direction of what is required by morality, what is necessary for the habitability of our planet, what we must pursue if we are to survive, the complete abolition of the institution of war. One more point, when I say that war can never be justified, I'm willing to agree to disagree about wars in the past if we can agree on wars in the future. That is, if you think that before nuclear weapons, before the end of legal conquest, before the general end of colonialism, and before the growth in understanding of the powers of nonviolence, some war like World War II was justified, I disagree and I'll tell you why at length, but let's agree that we now live in a different world in which Hitler does not live, and in which we must abolish war if our species is to continue. More time? Of course, if you want to travel back in time to World War II, 
why not travel back to World War I, the disastrous conclusion of which had smart observers predicting World War II on the spot? Why not travel back to the West's support for Nazi Germany in the 30s? We can look honestly at a war in which the U.S. was not threatened and about which the U.S. president had to lie to gain support, a war that killed several times the number of people in the war as were killed in the Nazis' camps, a war that followed the West's refusal to accept the Jews whom Hitler wanted to expel, a war that was entered through provocation of the Japanese, not innocent surprise. We can learn history instead of mythology, but let's recognize that we can choose to do better than our history going forward. So when my colleague tells us that a war is only justified, this was his opening remarks, a war is justifiable when your country has been attacked by an aggressor nation. This does not describe any wars I'm aware of. It certainly does not describe the Gulf War. Who attacked the United States to start the Gulf War? Who attacked the United States to start the war on Bosnia? This is a mythology that somehow having U.S. troops abroad being attacked, or having our economic interest. This was Trump's State of the Union. He justified more military spending, more nuclear weapons, because nations might challenge our values or our economic interests. Are you going to threaten genocide for a better trade agreement? What do you mean, threaten your values? You mean not share them? I'd be glad if people didn't share Mr. Trump's values in many cases, I'm sorry to say. So I would love to hear from my colleagues some examples of when the United States was attacked by an aggressor nation and why we need to dump our grandchildren's unearned pay into preparing for that eventuality rather than making it less likely by behaving better as a citizen of the world and cooperating and making friends with other nations instead of provoking them to further war. Thank you. Thank you, especially for the nice setup at the end. Um, yeah, we haven't been attacked, which is wonderful. Um, so we're, we haven't been the person walking home tonight who gets attacked. But we are the police officer. We are the fully capable person who can prevent other people from being attacked and who can come to their aid, whether it's to the Kuwaitis, whether it's the Bosnians, uh, whether it's the people of France and England. I would encourage you to go over to World War II ceremonies in Europe. The people love us. I've lived in Europe three years. I lived in Germany, where my neighbors came and they bring you food. They're really great. Uh, lived in two different cities in Germany, and both thanked the United States for freeing them from Hitler. I went over to the World Cup. I wanted to watch the World Cup versus Argentina just a few years ago. Once I got in the World Cup, I grabbed one of my sons. We're going to Germany. We watched it in Heidelberg, and people were just buying us drinks, and the first thing my um, Airbnb person said when he saw me, Hitler, no good. America, good. I was like, great. I was like, I've forgotten about Hitler. Don't worry about him. Um, a pacifist is someone who has never been threatened. Realistically, when you're threatened, you're willing to fight back. There's a great book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, written by Chris Hedges. He was a New York Times correspondent uh, during the siege of Sarajevo. He was in Sarajevo. And just talking a few months ago, he said, both these lines, he considered himself anti-war pacifist. He's seen too much war, he hates it. He says, war is always wrong. But boy, I was really proud of those Sarajevans. They were totally justified in fighting to stop extin extinction from the Bosnian Serbs who were attacking him. Well, then war's not always wrong. The Bosnian Serbs were wrong, but you just said how much you admired and how much you loved and how proud you were of the Bosnian uh, Muslims fighting back. So it comes back to our same point. In war, there is always someone who's really bad, or maybe people who are really confused, but usually there's someone bad, doing something they shouldn't, being a militarist. The person fighting back is justified. Um, suicide, that's a terrible thing. One thing I work for, if you look up for me, or I work on is moral injury. I think we have to help soldiers make sense of encountering evil in war, and, and it seems to just jump off on you, but the problem of suicide is a much bigger problem than just our veterans. It seems to be a problem of meaning within our society. Um, how can you kill and respect someone? How much time do I have? 30 seconds? We should, love, we should love our enemies. I don't think we train this way, but I think it is fully consistent to love someone 
and in certain circumstances in order to protect others to do violence to them. Let's say I had an alcoholic brother who was very violent, who was in and out of jail for years. And one time when he's really drunk, he's coming out and saying he's got a gun, he's going to get in a car, and he wants to go kill some person for whatever reason. And all his other brothers, knowing you can't reason with him when he's drunk and he's this angry, go up and have to fight him and beat, beat him up to stop him from going out on the road, killing someone else or killing himself. That was an act of love. If you just came up with it, it was an act of violence. Right. And so, okay. Two, two wars out of dozens and dozens of wars over the past decades cannot possibly justify keeping around the most disastrous, costly institution uh, known to humanity, the worst thing we ever do to each other. We, we can talk about why those two particular wars were not necessary, were not last resorts, were not just causes, were not, I, I mean, the, the propaganda to sell the war on, on Yugoslavia, the, the intentional, as I said, avoiding of agreement in the debate, but to justify this disastrous institution and all of the agreed upon unjust wars uh, in recent decades with those two little wars uh, is ridiculous. Uh, I, I heard, Pete, in an in a interview, you talking about soldiers killing people uh, on Haifa Street in Baghdad, and they killed three insurgents, clearly bad people. What is a clearly bad person, I want to know? And how is it that you love them and characterize them based on not having met them, but having heard they were armed and in a street in Iraq, clearly bad people? And again, yet again, what good did killing all those people in all those streets in Iraq do for Iraq? So basic. Uh, <laughs> you just want to open Q and A. I'm sorry. Do you want to go Q and A? Um, People take them. Whatever you, whatever you guys think. Well, your your schedule says you want you ask each other questions, but you, you, whatever you want. I, mean, to I don't do. have any particular question. I mean, I, I question a whole lot of the facts, yeah. but <laughs> we're not. I don't think that's going to make Shall progress. We, Shall we have the audience? Uh, raise your hand if you want to go to audience questions. Let's do it. I mean, we'll try to alternate back and forth and maybe both answer. <laughs> yes, we're, we're supposed to ask each other questions. I'm not sure if my partner wants to okay, do that. Okay, you can ask me a question first, and then I'll think up. It's well, I've, a I've asked quite a few. Uh, I've asked what good has been done uh, thus far to, for Iraq. I've asked how you can quantify which wars are the good yeah. ones and which wars are the bad ones? Well, I mean, these are pretty good. I mean, the good ones are the ones in which there is a value to defending human rights in the political communities. I mean, I know you've never been to Iraq, you haven't been to Afghanistan, you haven't been to Kuwait. I spent a lot of time there. I had the, the great luxury, I wasn't a trigger puller, I was a researcher. And so I went along with patrols day after day when their 2007 surge, when they're clearing pretty much every house in Baghdad and in the country looking for weapons. And I would just sit and talk with the family, with the interpreters while soldiers were going through things. Um, I found overwhelmingly the people wanted us there. They didn't trust our national police, which was all Shiite, who were executing Sunnis wherever they could find them. They didn't like the Sunni tribes and the sons of Iraq who were killing Shiites whenever they could. Um, maybe we made the mistake. I think Iraq was a strategic error. Um, they didn't have nuclear weapons. They had chemical and biological weapons. Um, we, we almost invaded Syria uh, in 2003, chasing after them. The Israelis took care of those later. So, and we had more than 90 soldiers wounded by chemical weapons during their time there. So the narrative that there was none there isn't true. An interesting thing, I got to be involved, so I was part of the history of the Army studying the history of the war, the official history, so got to do interviews, everything from four-star Tommy Franks down to soldiers. And I wasn't in the interrogations of the Iraqi Republican Guard generals, but I talked to the people who did. And they were fascinated to learn in May 2003 that the general of one division was told that the other division, right, had nukes and chemical weapons. And this general was told that one did. And Saddam Hussein played them off against each other for loyalty. Hey, the other guy's got the weapons. If you guys aren't loyal, they're just going to do it to you. So it's a very complicated thing that doesn't justify what we did. Um, it was imprudent. 
if you're going to do a humanitarian invasion or a humanitarian intervention, you need to be set up and organized to do a humanitarian intervention. Um, okay. Can I reply, or do you want to ask me a question? Or? Um, yeah, I would ask a question. So the people of Taiwan, the people of South Korea, the people of all of Central Europe, uh, these countries that are asking the United States to put forces there, asking us to help defend them, because they have a big neighbor who has territorial ambitions on them, do you think we should abandon them militarily and publicly announce that we would not come to their defense? Well, when I was in Afghanistan, despite never having been in Afghanistan, oh, I okay. saw a very are. different picture. And when I look at the world and talk with people around the world, as I do every day, I get a very different picture. Uh, when you poll the world, as I said in my opening remarks, you get a very different response. The U.S. not appreciated as the global cop, in fact, viewed as the greatest threat to peace in the world. The people of South Korea had a nonviolent revolution, an impeachment, uh, an overthrow, a new government, because the old government would not stand up to the United States. Uh, and the new president is now finally showing signs of standing up to the United States. States. The people of South Korea do not want a war between the United States and North Korea. They're the ones who are going to die in it. Do you first. think we want a war between uh, North and South Korea? I, uh, can do you I, believe can, we want a war? Can I, can I do the two minutes and then you okay, get another sorry. question? Uh, what, what the CIA said before attacking Iraq was any weapons they have will only be used if they're attacked. What the Pacific Command of the U.S. military says now is that North Korea is no threat. It would be suicidal for them. Uh, there is absolutely no chance uh, of North Korea starting this war. Uh, it is going to be the United States. And, and of course, Iran, the other demon uh, haunting everyone, it has never had a nuclear weapons program, uh, is not threatening anybody, hasn't started a war it, literally in centuries. Uh, do I think anybody wants a war? I think when you see the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations go and almost parrot word for word Colin Powell substituting the word Iran for Iraq, that's somebody wanting a war. I think when Mike Pence, uh, uh, and, and as well as the president of Japan, and Mike Pence's wife seem to be the only three human beings in a giant stadium who cannot stand for a celebration of peace and unity and must sit on their rears glaring around at people wishing for hostilities, uh, that's, that's resistance to peace, if nothing else. OK, want to keep asking each other questions, or shall we? I'll, just, I'll do a final comment, because I think you try to create division where there's not. I have deep concerns. I, I hate the military industrial complex. Right? We don't need to be doing that. Um, I think we need to reassess our role around the world. Um, I think every country that we have forces in should have a plebiscite, have a vote to say whether they want us to make, a, make them commit to that. All of those are fully consistent with the principle for people in the United States or anywhere in the world that every political community has the right to defend itself against external attack. And if you don't think that there's bad actors who conduct external attacks, then I'm not sure how all these wars are always happening all over the, the war. Yeah. But if or, you, or let, the, the you let the people of Jeju Island have a vote, there goes the new base on Jeju Island. You let the people of Okinawa have a vote, there goes the, you let the people of Italy have a vote, there go the base. I mean, the, 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 the protests, well, let's see. the resistance. What do you mean, let's see? It, it, Vicenza, Italy, where I used to live, they had a public vote. Do you want the base expanded several fold? Overwhelmingly, no. They, over, they threw out the government. They overthrew the national government of Italy over this issue. And what happened? They built the base anyway. I guess I have to trust you. And the things I know about, I get some concerns, but we can open the questions. I, I believe, I, I'm not the oh. moderator here, but there's mics in the aisles. And there's mics in the aisles. And if you guys are ready, we can open We're ready. It. Sounds good. And uh, shall we have a time limit on responses? Uh, Two? And sure. Please, please, when you ask a question, uh, designate which uh, debater you would like to ask it of. Okay, um, uh, would you like our names? Does that matter? My name's Eric Anspaul. I'm from Franklin County, Virginia, uh, Rocky Mount. I'm a um, discharg honorably discharged member of the Air Force of the United States as a conscientious objector. Um, 
back around the time of the Vietnam War. I um, Thank you for that service. Thank you. I want to offer my questions to uh, Pete. And, and they are short questions, Pete, and uh, I hope you can answer these very, very, very so, briefly. Yeah, just give us a total two minutes. I'll try to answer them real quick. Okay. Rapid um, fire. You may see my shirt here. It says, "If Jesus, when Jesus says love our enemies, I think he meant don't kill them. Um, in light of Jesus' teaching to love our enemies, how does any war make sense? That's my first question. And as a member of the Church of the Brethren, one of the historic peace churches, we have always taken the position that all war is sin. Um, what's your response to that? And then thirdly, if I may, you said that a pacifist, and I'm a conscientious objector, so I guess you could say I'm a pacifist, is one who's never been threatened. I would ask you about Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, who were threatened and who remain nonviolent. Thank you for taking my questions. And that's great. You could add Gandhi to that, right? Because they were, they were trying to convince uh, a, a wider population that did have strong values and care about what's right and wrong. So that's the third, your question. The first question about um, how can we love our neighbor and kill them. You don't go just... Enemies and kill how, them. How, yeah, your enemies. Well, everyone's our neighbor, right, in that sense. You only do it. I think a, a very healthy analogy for thinking about war is a doctor performing an amputation. Because if you just look at the action, that dude just went up and cut someone's leg off with a saw. It's violent, it's sad, it changes things forever bad, right? But in the larger context, the only choices they had at that point were to let the person die or to perform the amputation. So war happens in the realm of really bad choices, right? War happens when we all say we want peace, but someone's not allowing that to go on. And so that's the problem in the same way that if a handicapped, you know a handicapped teenager got a hold of a gun and he's going into a park and you know he's mentally handicapped and you love the kid and you're the police officer and you come up and he's starting to shoot people, you have to shoot him. You hate it, it's sad, it's tragic, but in the crappy situation, it's the best that can be done. And that's what war is. War isn't good. War isn't like helping people cross the street. War is saying is, we have an awful situation. What can we do to end the situation to reestablish peace and security? And so the love, sometimes you have to say, it's not the most loving thing to do to engage you, but it's the loving thing to protect all these people you're threatening. That's how. I want to reply to that, but maybe we can take another question and maybe it'll right. fit in. No. Okay, the one on this side. Uh, my name's David Oliver, and I live in Meadows of Dan. Uh, I'm a scientist, uh, physicist, and biologist, and have spent a lot of time thinking about human biology. Um, I'd like to offer just a brief answer to the question, why is there war, and why is it persistent? That's not a stupid question, and I think I can give you some insight. Um, the casualty rate in war, historically, is enormously low. Now, that may seem surprising, but I think Pete probably knows what some of these statistics are. Uh, the largest death rates for both civilians and uh, military were in World War II. And the Soviet Union suffered the greatest loss of life for a large country, 15%. But um, Belarus actually had a 26% loss of life. And uh, the US loss of life in the Second World War, some people might not know this, it was three thousandths of 1%. It didn't touch us much at all. Now, it may have economically been, uh, well, actually, economically, it was stimulating. It took us out of the recession. Now, the point I would make from the, from the perspective of human biology is that the low casualty rate of war, historically, is a indicator that war pays, that war has benefit. And the benefit is that the predator gets away with something. And 
the other side of that coin is that those who would be preyed upon have better organized themselves and get defensive. So you have the mechanism for generating war. And if the casualty rate were 50%, as it was in the most destructive war of all time, which was in 1864, the war between Paraguay and Brazil killed 50% of the population and only 30% of the males survived. Population of 400,000 went down to 200,000, and of that 200,000, only 30% were males. Well, you don't start, you don't say, I'm gonna go to war the next generation. That takes all of the steam out of it. So if the casualty rate in war were to be extreme, 50%, every time you go to war, you're gonna suffer a 50% casualty rate. And you can also add to that the loss of treasure. There will be a 50% loss of national treasure. It, would, it wouldn't be done. But, but, but the fact that it's low yeah. makes it feasible. Can, so can more I respond pace. to this one? Because I also wanted to respond to your earlier. Okay, can I make one pithy comment and then you get the whole thing? I was gonna say, we, well, the biggest thing we could do to cut down on unnecessary wars is make it that everyone who votes for war, the president and everyone else, their family members have to go fight on the front lines. Because if, if it's really worth it, then it should be worth it for your family and your lives too. Once that was the case with Leonidas, right, and some kind of leaders, and we have the opposite now, and that's a risk. So I, I think uh, your comments, uh, sir, are very helpful and useful and relevant. I, I think it's useful to point out that the casualty rate uh, in Iraq uh, was very significant uh, in the recent wars uh, out for the Iraqi population, uh, whereas the U.S. deaths in that war, like in most wars that take up 90% of the reported deaths in U.S. media, were, you know, 3% or something of the deaths in that war. I, I just wanted to speak to this constant uh, retreating to analogies. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become a debater against analogies uh, because, you know, <laughs> it, 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 a good Samaritan uh, as an individual uh, is not relevant to the institution of war or the launching of war by governments or non-governmental groups. Even warmonger herself, Margaret Thatcher, said if the Good Samaritan had just had good intentions, nobody would remember him. He also had money. Well, he not only had money, he had a voice. He had a brain. This notion that if you see someone being attacked on a street, there's nothing you can do but shoot the attacker. That you can't say, for example, as, as uh, you know, to, to take the analogy to the level of U.S. military spending, uh, would you like five trillion dollars to stop attacking that person? You can't, you can't do anything other than shoot him. But, it, but it's just to even, for me to even engage in that discussion takes us away from the question of war, which has almost no relationship to doctors performing surgeries uh, or people rescuing victims of mugging. Uh, it, it's, you know, if, if we're gonna talk about war, let's talk about some wars. Okay, uh, hi, my name is Eric Stetson. I'm from Independence, Virginia, and I'm the chairman of the uh, Democratic Party of Grayson County. Uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, both of the debaters for all the excellent points you're making. I think it's incredibly thought-provoking. Um, and I think you've both made some really good points. Um, there's one issue in particular that I'm really interested to hear more uh, from you, especially from David, and that's on the issue of nonviolent resistance to evil in the world. Um, I personally am skeptical that, that that can always be effective. I think there are some cases uh, where it may not be effective. I think, you know, obviously the seminal example in history is the Jews of um, Germany and Eastern Europe in, in the World War II period under Hitler, where, um, you know, there really wasn't any way to prevent Hitler from uh, slaughtering six million of them in the gas chambers um, because he, he was uh, a man who was hell-bent on implementing his evil vision of genocide. And, 
doing sort of the Gandhi style nonviolent resistance may not have been effective in that case. Um, but it sounds like your opinion is that it always can be effective and I'm interested to hear more about specifically how you believe that that can be the case uh, in a situation like, for example, fighting back against Hitler nonviolently. Um, another point I want to make or question related to this is how do you feel about, a lot of your resistance to war seems to be about the abuse of war by the United States. And I have to say, I 100% agree with you that the United States has been uh, overly militaristic in its policy around the world and, and that the vast majority of the wars that we've been involved in have been unnecessary for us to get involved and probably counterproductive. However, I want to ask you, what do you think about the idea of international institutions taking over the responsibility in the world for peacekeeping? What if we had a more robust United Nations, for example, or some kind of organization of that nature that would play the role of being sort of the defense mechanism of last resort in cases like genocide, uh, where there may need to be some kind of defense, militaristically, of people who are going to be slaughtered by an evil dictator or so forth? So those are my questions. So that is a ridiculous amount of good questions to try to put into two minutes, but I will do my best. Uh, Nonviolent movements are not always effective. No one has ever claimed they are. What ha the facts have shown is that they have become over twice as likely to succeed as principally violent movements. Uh, I, I wish these plastic bottles of water around here were Evian because I think it's relevant that Evian is a town in France where the Western uh, the nations of the world met and considered sh where, where will we accept all the Jews that, that the Nazis want to expel. They didn't want to kill them for years. They wanted to expel them. It's equally, not equally, but it's insane. Uh, and the, the outcome was, as with numerous other conferences, through right through the course of the war, we will not accept them. You know, we get all righteous about Anne Frank. The State Department turned down her visa. The, the, the Coast Guard chased a ship of Jewish refugees away from Miami. And, and when they had that conference at Evian, Hitler said, look, look, these hypocrites, they say I should be nicer to the Jews, but they won't take them because they know how evil the Jews are. And then you had an escalation of violence against the Jews. It, it, right through the course of the war, Churchill and, and the, the State Department were telling uh, the peace activists who were demanding that the Jews be taken out, we can't be bothered. We couldn't do it. This was after Dunkirk, after they'd proven they could do it, right? So, you know, which has very little to do with serious claims to support World War II, but it's, it has a lot to do with the mythology around it. Uh, and when you look at the, the women who went into the street in Berlin, in Rosenstrasse, and demanded that their Jewish husbands be released, and the crowd grew, and they were released, people didn't know enough to escalate. They all went home and said, you know, we know a lot more about nonviolence now than people knew back then. Uh, so I think when you, go, when you look at something like the people in Tunisia seven years ago overthrowing a government with a nonviolent movement, you know, many, you know, many flaws, far from, you know, perfect paradise in Tunisia, you wouldn't go back to them and say, hey, you really should try this other method that kills lots of people and is over twice as likely to fail. You know, just because they might have failed, of course they might have failed. Uh, there, there's a book on the table that, like you, advocates for a, a, a world with better international uh, institutions in which we can do without war. Okay, uh, uh, Pete would like to address that question also. Yeah, when I heard the question, you know, is nonviolence always effective? I'm trying to wonder, has nonviolence ever been effective against a foreign invader? People like to say, oh, Sweden and Finland, they had nonviolent movements. They were not liberated until the United States and British Army and the French Free Army came through and liberated them, right? So they may have resisted, but they didn't make any progress. So I have a question, has there ever been a nonviolent movement that has expelled a foreign invader? Okay, that, that was a colonial thing. I'm talking about a country that has attacked and invaded you. That country. India wasn't invaded and yeah, occupied? Okay. I'll, I'll oh, give you all the that, examples I gave okay. in my opening remarks, but why is that a bad example? Well, I mean, that was colonialism and British, okay, going, all right, like, I'll grant you that one. All right, let's have another where country A invades country B, and country B, instead of fighting, says, 
We're just going to be nonviolent resistors. Have they ever expelled and regained their liberty? And I want to learn. South Africa's another one. South Africa did it primarily through uh, not passive resistance. Yeah. Through the military. What year? What year? Well, that's apartheid. Okay, can anyone talk to me about a foreign invader? Apparently not, yeah. right? Apartheid was, the, the Boers had been there for hundreds of years. That was a change in government. But you're not Nelson Mandela, I love him. I escorted him when he came to West Point. That was not a case of a foreign invader. Well, you're not going to count the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. You're not going to count the Baltics and their nonviolent movements that, that took apart the Soviet Union. If you're not going to count Morocco in Western Sahara, if you're not going to count uh, Israel in parts of Palestine, if you're not going to count uh, parts of Ukraine, in fact, in, in the current turmoil on both sides of the question, e expelling armed invaders nonviolently from their cities. I mean, what, what are you going to count as a violent invasion? Well, I was thinking of violent invasion. We can go on to the next question. I, I was open to an answer, and those aren't answers. I uh, good evening, gentlemen. My name is Michael Getman. I'm a junior at Virginia Tech, so Pete, go, go Hokies, Uprosum, and all that good stuff. Uh, I came here because my Geography of Modern Conflict teacher, Ken Stiles, recommended this. Uh, if, if I'd like to see a part two maybe between Mr. Swanson and Ken, because he's a CIA spook with almost 30 years of experience. But my question is, especially for your thoughts on World War II's necessity, when you have Japan because of uh, because of all the economic reasons they invade China, and they do things like the rape of uh, the rape of Manchuria, which I believe killed something like 10 million people, and in turn to this horrible genocide of the Chinese people, the U.S. does an oil embargo on Japan. Now, of course, that puts the screws on them more, but does that give Japan then the right to bomb uh, to bomb U.S. the Pearl Harbor fleet? I am horribly sorry if anyone got the impression I ever hinted that anyone had the right to bomb anyone. I'm here to argue against bombing people. Uh, they, they, you know, the, the fact that the United States took steps to provoke Japan to attack and knew Japan was about to attack doesn't excuse Japan attacking people and killing them. You know, you can't, you don't find one person to blame for something and the rest of the world is now a bunch of angels exonerated from all fault. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem is that through the 1930s, and we would know this if we taught the history of the peace movement, you had marches and demonstrations and lobbying in the United States, marches through New York City demanding that the United States stop preparing for war with Japan, stop provoking Japan. The United States not only imposed embargoes on Japan that led one of the jurists at the Tokyo Tribunal to conclude that the U.S. provoked Japan, the U.S. gave planes and trainers and even sent pilots over to China to help bomb Japan pre-Pearl Harbor and made sure Japan knew about it. Uh, the United States, uh, the president of the United States, wanted to get into the war in Europe and had committed to Churchill to doing whatever it took to get an incident with Japan that would allow the United States to get in both parts of the war. And this is what happened. None of which remotely excuses any of Japan's horrendous, murderous crimes. And I can't imagine why anyone would think it did. But you, you overlook, just like in your book, you totally, totally overlook that Japan invaded China and was committing genocide. I'm sure you know about the rape of Nanking in 1937. So the economic sanctions were a nonviolent way to try to pressure to stop the Japanese genocide on China. Why is that? Wasn't our sanctions against them a, an appropriate nonviolent response to their unjustified invasion? Sanctions are very often not violent, and that was not the intention of those sanctions, and that was not the result of those sanctions. Uh, sanctions very often are quite murderous. Uh, look, you, if you wanted to prevent Japan uh, committing crimes, you'd need to support a world with the rule of law, a world that can hold nations accountable for crimes as criminals. The United States trained up Japan as a, as a little brother in imperialism, uh, put forth a Monroe Doctrine for Asia, for Japan. We'll let Japan do imperialism in Asia. Encouraged Japan, armed Japan. This is why NBC had to just apologize for saying that Japan was a great model for every Korean. Uh, and, and yet, 
when Japan turned against what the United States wanted, it became the enemy of the United States, now to be fought with the same tools that Japan had been... Japan went literally for centuries without wars. Uh, and its culture flourished, and it, and it became what people know and love in Japan today, without wars. Uh, and the West undid that. Uh, it doesn't excuse Japan's crimes, uh, but to, to act as if, you know, the, the United States didn't help it, and then provoke it, and then antagonize it, and then impose sanctions not to try to make peace, imposed sanctions to try to provoke a Japanese attack. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question, sure. Yeah. I first thank you all very much for this evening. It's extremely powerful and uh, kind of unnerving. Um, my father was Jewish, so I still have a difficult time uh, not being for World War II, but I've been opposed to every war since and have been out marching in the streets here in D.C. and elsewhere. Um, you did mention, and I was pleased, uh, when Eisenhower said, beware of the military-industrial complex. I, I wish we all were a little more aware of that. But uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles said, and I don't know the exact percentages <laughs> because I'm a little bit out of it there, but we are like 10% of the world's population controlling like 45% or more of the world's resources, and we must continue to control those world's resources. And I'm wondering how much of our involvement in war is because of our wanting to control the world's resources. I'm happy to take that. Did you want to take that? Oh. Um, we, we both can. We can first, you know, the. Um, one of the great just warists of the 20th century, Michael Waltzer, who was at Princeton, now at NYU, I interviewed him, and I asked, you know, how did you, where did you develop your just war thinking? And he said, you know, as a Jewish boy growing up in New York City in World War II, I never doubted that there was a time when war is just. And then he opposed the Vietnam War, and he wanted to try to figure this out. He wrote Just and Unjust Wars. Um, in terms of, yeah, this, the, much of this debate is, or not our debate, but many of the concerns about war are concerns about militarism, right? We all need to educate ourselves as to the limited conditions on when war is justified and then step up and be politically active and hold our leaders accountable so that we only go to war in defense of innocent political communities. We have an absolute duty, our government does, to defend us. That's the first thing that governments do, protect your people. And we have the option to protect others. Right? And so there's always, I don't doubt that there's mixed motives. I don't doubt that there's pure militarism, that there's economic interests that get involved in a lot of those things. I do want to throw this out, and I know you hate your analogies, but this is an analogy. When I was in high school, I was stupid, and a friend and I decided Ocean City, Maryland, who could swim out the farthest and still make it back. And so we were just com very competitive. And like, who was going to quit first and come back? And we went out. And at some point, we were both so tired, we were like, hey, let's just agree it's a tie. And then we tried to swim back in, and we were really tired, and the tide was coming out. Bottom line is we had to get rescued. And it was, it was very embarrassing. You know, everyone comes out. You get pulled in, pulled up on the beach. There's a big crowd. Um, and I thought about that because it was in the newspaper the next, you know, that week, a picture of it and stuff, more humiliation. And I wondered about the motives. So... With that lifeguard, whether she did it out of duty or whether she did it out of glory or whether she did it to get a bonus or whether she did it to save me, it still had the effect of saving me. Right? So we should question mixed motives. A lot of times when we're helping another country, we don't help them purely for, their, for the lives of those people. We're, we're doing it for the lives of the people plus we're finding an economic or international interest. But if we ever do it for national interest where we're not actually helping people, then we're wrong. It's worth pointing out that militarism is not in our economic interests, uh, that for every dollar spent on militarism, you could have had more jobs and better economic impact by spending it otherwise, uh, especially on education, also on infrastructure, and even on tax cuts for working people, so that military spending is actually a drain. Is that it, many of your books? Uh, 
Uh, well, look at, look at the endless studies done in subsequent years by the University of Massachusetts Amherst uh, on this question of military spending versus other types of spending. Um, but, you know, military spending is a primary driver of war. The more you spend on it, the more wars you get. Uh, there are political interests, there are other corrupt interests, there are uh, you know, various uh, interests that come down to the endless desire to dominate the planet. Uh, you know, they're, they're not all rational interests. Um, but I think if we, if Pete and I or, or any of us could agree on what to do with the military budget, well, this debate would become more academic. Um, because I don't know if you think the military budget is just right or it needs to be a little higher, it needs to be a little lower. If we could agree that it could be a little lower. Yeah, it you should know, be lower. Yeah. But do, mean, you agree you that it, do you agree that it has to do with controlling the world's resources, like John Foster Dulles suggested, that we've got to be able to control the resources? Do you think I, that is at all a purpose or reason why we continue going to war? I, I, like I, I think it is on oil. But. I think war combined with the much beloved sanctions, combined with the, the, the debt and the uh, policies of the, of the IMF and other global institutions uh, are largely driven, yes, by the desire to dominate the globe, which, which predates the, the colonizing of this country was a big motivation of the revolution that got th this country across the mountains, uh, that drove the expansion uh, once the, the belief uh, was dominant that the Pacific had been reached and there could be no more dominating this continent. I mean, the, 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 the drive to dominate the entire globe is why those few places that don't have U.S. bases are the targets, are the demons on your televisions. It's why the bases are being built now in Syria, because Russia had bases in Syria. Uh, you know, so it, it, I think you, you can't give one explanation. I've never seen a war that didn't have numerous motivations. But when you, you look at the, 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 at the time, secret discussions during wars that later become public, for example, in the White House during the time in, in, in Vietnam, they, you know, they would discuss why should we keep the war going? Because it's just a foregone conclusion. And then they would discuss why should we tell people we keep the war going? They, you know, before the attack on Iraq in 2003, it was what can we all agree on as the best sales point? And they sort of they say weapons of mass destruction is the, the thing that, you know, that we can, most of us agree will, will fly best. But it, it's not the actual motivations. But our controlling yeah. of the world's resources is not really what? a key issue then. I, I don't think, yes. you know, our longest war is Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan has a lot of resources, and well, yeah. we haven't touched them, and in fact, China's exploiting them like crazy. Uh -huh. So uh, sometimes a little frustration of like, hey, we're paying billions, hundreds of billions, to try to establish a country here, and whatever security they're getting, China is mining the heck out of it right now. So I think that's a data point. If we wanted to exploit that, we would have. I know, who was the Assistant Secretary of Defense, Wolf? Wolfowitz. Wolfowitz. Yeah. You know, he said, we're going to move in and use Iraqi oil to pay off for the war. Well, we never did that. It yeah. would have been a terrible idea, and it was even dumber to say it out. But that well, it failed doesn't mean it wasn't a motivation. Uh, yeah. in, right. in most respects, these things fail dramatically. Uh, mm -hmm. But right. at the but time of going into Afghanistan. Afghanistan, the public discussion in the U.S. media, people like Brzezinski talking about the need to have Afghanistan because of a pipeline mm -hmm. because of positioning of weapons. Right. Uh, you know, in more recent years, the talk of the of the mineral wealth mm -hmm. in Afghanistan that yeah. has motivated the refusal to leave. Trump almost wanted to leave, as I said, and Mattis said, "No, we have to have more troops. We have to stay there." Uh, and Trump said, "Why? Well, so so that a bomb doesn't blow up in Times Square." I, I, you know, they, I mean. The, 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 there's numerous excuses. I think motivations is, is to give a little bit too much dignity to these things, but there are numerous excuses, and, and a lot of them don't make sense, uh, and a lot of them don't pan out, but they really were part of the discussion. Hi, I'm Kim Rewer, I'm a senior at Radford, and I have a question for David. I, you probably um, answered this, but I was just wanting to get a clear answer. Wait, so do you think war is justifiable ever? Uh, no, that's no? the purpose of this debate, for me to say no and him to say yes. Yeah, I know, but you, I feel like you kind of <coughs> went over and around the line a little bit um, because you had mentioned that like going forward, if blank, then you would say that war is justifiable what earlier What was the blank talk. you lost? I know, that's where I was lost as well. I think you were saying something, if we could um, go forward and say that 
war is never justifiable, then you would justify the wars prior. I, I, I think I may know what you're referring to. Oh. What I was saying was that if, if, if you've been indoctrinated by decades of World War II right. stories, uh -huh. the top subject of US entertainment, never mind history texts, right. and you just can't bring yourself to decide that World War II wasn't a great war. Right. Can you maybe still, nonetheless, agree with me uh -huh. that in, a, in, the, in today's world, in which we cannot go forward with this risk of nuclear apocalypse and survive it and have that luck go on forever. We cannot go on wasting these resources and destroying the natural environment in this way. We, don't, we have powers of nonviolence people didn't know about back then, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. Can you agree with me that no war can possibly be justified going forward. Okay, so are you saying take away this huge um, example that everyone pulls to when they're using war, <laughs> saying that war is justifiable, take that away and then? I, I just think to persuade most people in the United States that World War II is not justified would take me a week, not 90 minutes. <laughs> uh, and, and so, it, 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 I, I, let me be time. crystal clear. Right. I do not believe that was a good war. I do not believe there has ever been a good war. I okay. think the concept is insane. Uh -huh. But if you're willing to agree with me that we shouldn't put a trillion dollars a year into preparing in case there's a good war next week, mm -hmm. You know, let's agree to disagree about World War II and move forward by building a public movement in this country to force these creeps in Washington, D.C. not to move another pile of money from just about everything else into war preparation, but to do the exact opposite. Okay, um, I have a question. Again, this ties into it. Um, so the base of America was kind of built up on like, we do, I'm obviously using very loose terms here, but like we do our own thing and um, we kind of, we're uh, a lot of defense. America has a lot of defense. So do you think that um, it would be really hard to um, change the cycle right now of you know not being attacked if we were to kind of pull out a lot of our resources from defense because we've made a fair amount of enemies? I think that it would be wise to revert to the 1947 name of the institution, which was the Department of War, and to stop pretending it has anything to do with defense, and okay. to question whether uh, ships that carry airplanes around the world's oceans are defensive, to question whether putting missiles in countries around the world, to question whether 90% of what the Department of So-Called Defense does is in any way defensive. If you want to believe in militarized defense and mm -hmm. you want to have a Coast Guard and you want to have some preparations to defend the actual United States, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not mythical threats to, of, of massacres around the globe and so forth, uh, you know, then, you know, let's move forward on those terms. Let's take out, let's get rid of the weapons that have no defensive purpose. Let's get rid of the bases deployed in other people's countries around the globe. Let's revert to having things that can make some plausible case to actually being defensive. And then we'll be well on our way to abolishing war. Okay, so you're fine with defense, but not with offense under the guise of defense. It, it does sound like you <laughs> no. said war could be justifiable if it's purely defensive, which has no. been my argument no. the okay. whole time. Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Let me try very, very hard to be clear <laughs> as a step toward abolishing an institution that has no value whatsoever, uh -huh. beginning by getting rid of the weapons and the policies and the agencies that we can all agree are offensive, uh -huh. would be a wonderful first step. Okay, and then do I have time for one question for him? And I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I just knew his because someone else said it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, oh, so you were talking about earlier, your premise, one of your premises was, once um, someone creates an act of violence, their human right to not be, I think what you said was not be killed, but I like have the, what is taken away from them. Am I wrong there? When someone is posing a threat of violence to someone who still possesses the right, mm -hmm. the attacker forfeits their right, which is why you're allowed to fight back against them. Okay, so it's the threat. So a preemptive, a preemptive strike is justifiable? Under very limited conditions. So this would be the individual thing. If someone is coming up to you and they got two, you know, they got one big pipe mm -hmm. and they're backing you into a corner and then you see that they, as you backed up there was a big old knife or a gun mm -hmm. and then they're saying they're gonna kill you mm -hmm. and they're reaching down for the gun mm -hmm. 
If you went and kicked them, that would be a preemptive attack because they hadn't hurt you yet. Right, okay. But it has to be that extreme. Mm -hmm. In 2003, at a, well, in 2002 speech graduation at West Point, the president did a policy of preemptive assault, which I think is morally indefensible. Uh, president, Vice President Cheney said, just war theory says it has to be that extreme. It says three conditions. They have a manifest intent to harm you, they're actively preparing, and you can't wait any longer and still defend yourself. And the paradigm case is the 1967 war, Israel against the Arab coalition. Um, Cheney said, well, in the age side? of terrorism and mass destruction, and, and weapons of mass destruction, if there's a 1% chance, we're justified in preemptively going. That national security strategy has been thrown out. Um, so, yes, you can preemptively attack, be the first to land the blow or the first to do violence, but it better meet those conditions. They're clear they're going to hurt you, they have the capability to hurt you, and you just can't wait any longer. And you have to be very careful that it's not just your perception that, for example, the world community says, yep, this is a really bad situation. I had one more question for him. Is that okay? okay? I'm really <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I, I, I can, like, go in the back of the line. <laughs> Would that be better? Okay, awesome. Yeah, why don't you let them go and then you can go. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, okay. I'm Marquita Hill in Blacksburg, and I'm just maybe poking at you a little bit, Pete, but you were trying to, um, I believe, if I understood you correctly, that even though you, there are, could be multiple reasons for a war in which the United States was engaged, there was usually some good reason or some decent reason involved in there somewhere. And the first thing that came to no, mind... No, I'm not saying that empirically. I'm not making that as empirical description. I'm saying that a war that has mixed motives that were saving, because listen to all the speeches. I listen to all the speeches the president's given. In the last century, they usually did a pretty good job of laying it out. We're going there to save hundreds of thousands of innocent lives, and it's really important to stabilize southern Europe, right? So there is saving lives and national interest. But if it's just national interest, it would be wrong. Okay, but what I was going to bring up, the first thing that came to mind when you were saying what I, neither of us completely understood each yeah, other, I'm sorry. was that the first thing that came to mind was Yemen. Poor, I mean, Yemen is being destroyed and people are suffering so horribly. And the United States, you may say they're not involved in the actual killing, but they are involved. They're, they're fueling the Saudi airplanes. They are uh, supporting the Saudi military and f furnishing them with weapons. I, the, I cannot think of any potential good reason why the United States is involved in helping Saudi Arabia destroy Yemen, which is basically what's happening, is that it's being destroyed. Yeah, I think I agree with you, yeah. Okay. From all the information I have, uh, and I don't know enough about that. A lot of wars I've been able to study, and that one I haven't. But it does seem to be, that's just a proxy war between Sunnis and Shia. And we've decided to go into the side of the Sunnis with our ally, Saudi Arabia, because the other side is Iran. And, um, I, but I don't know enough about, are we actually contributing to protecting communities? But from what I see in the media, it doesn't seem like a just war for us to be involved in. Okay, thank you. Can, can I reply 60 seconds? If you have time later, would you... You uh, were going to disagree with him on the 1967 war. If this time later, would you do that? Yes, we, we now know what the internal discussions were in Israel in 1967 and that it was a, a war of choice and a war of aggression uh, by Israel. I recommend uh, reading uh, books by Miko Peled, whose father was, of course, a hero for Israel of that war, uh, and what documents he has found and what that evidence is. Uh, I also recommend looking at the history of, of recent years uh, in Yemen, uh, in which uh, a gentleman by the name of Barack Obama claimed a successful drone war uh, in Yemen uh, that, quite on the contrary, uh, was instrumental uh, in stirring up uh, much of the trouble uh, in later years in Yemen. Uh, you are now looking at uh, a country whose horrible uh, dictator has fled uh, and then supposedly legalized attacking his former country by telling Saudi Arabia and the United States to attack it. This is, you know, when we've chased Trump out and he's living on his private island uh, and he asks uh, his buddies in China to attack the United States, that will make it legal and moral and good. No, it doesn't. Uh, and the United States is refueling 
the bombers uh, midair that were sold to Saudi Arabia after Saudi Arabia gave over $10 million into the Clinton Family Foundation, uh, and Boeing gave a million dollars into the Clinton Family Foundation. The United States is, is identifying the targets for bombing. Uh, the US military is engaged in destroying Yemen, along with a prince from Saudi Arabia who's coming to visit here in a couple of weeks who is uh, open about intentional famine, intentional starvation. So it sounds oh. like militarism, right? So I could, I could be standing right behind you with my arm around you. We all agree that, that that kind of war is just wrong, right? So that's the easy one. We can throw that out. Let's talk about the ones that are questionable. I mean, the core one is, is war ever justifiable if someone attacks, or is it never justifiable, right? And so, and many wars are people on both yeah, sides are just right. wrong. But it's, but it's the fantasy that there could be a justifiable one based on you know, the most ludicrous examples like Bosnia that allows us to keep the institution around that inevitably, as Eisenhower warned, saves genocide, generates... stops genocide. How can stopping genocide be wrong? It is genocide. The people of Yemen okay. are being killed. It is. Oh, I know. I'm talking Bosnia. We stopped yeah. the genocide. No. That's a good thing. I no. think it's a good escalated thing. it. Hi, um, my name is Sean Whiteside. I'm a professor here. Um, I, if, if I could, I'd just kind of like to critique the argument a little bit, uh, directed toward your on. argument, sir. They're all online, too, so you can jump on there, too. Okay. Um, I, I think I, I perhaps agree with Mr. Swanson uh, uh, with a little impatience for some of the analogies. Um, uh, several years ago, I was on my way home from band practice, and I had all my gear in my arms. And uh, so instead of unlocking my door, I knocked on it because my girlfriend was in there uh, so she could open it for me. Somebody followed my brother and I into the lobby of our uh, apartment complex and held a gun at me. Uh, after pointing the gun in my face, uh, my girlfriend opened the door, and he then pointed the gun at her. Uh, I don't believe that person gave up his right to life. Uh, my brother and I were able to wrestle him out the door without hurting him, without shooting him. I don't think that uh, if a police officer would have shown up, I don't think that the police officer would have been justified in, in killing that person. He had a gun and to your head? He had a gun pointed at me and my girlfriend. We were able to resolve the situation without bloodshed. That's good. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? Love and respect for him. Right, but you, according you to your analogy, you know, somebody would be justified in killing him. And in today's environment with police killings, uh, I, I would hope that you'd find maybe a more suitable uh, analogy there, particularly when other countries, you know, the, the police killings in many other countries number in the, you know, single digits as opposed to the several hundreds that we have in our country. And furthermore, I don't know if we can really extrapolate that onto an international stage because if we in the U.S. have problems with police issues, then we can uh, go to the ballot box, we can vote, uh, we can institute reforms. But somebody in another country has no political say in our country. And you can cite uh, you know, people in Germany who are glad at, at U.S. intervention, but the plural of anecdote is not data. You know, we do oh, need yeah, to... Yeah, we do need to look at, you know, polls like the, the polls that are saying that most people in the world actually u view the U.S. as the, you know, the, the biggest threat to I'm not sure you said, I don't think the poll said most people in the world. I think that you said that the I country think most threatening. The country most different. threatening. People well, agree that right. the U.S. is number one in that instance. We like to think of ourselves as number one, and, and that's one area where right. we actually are. Well, I do think, uh, what, what's your discipline? Uh, I teach in the art department. Okay. The... It's, it's not just analogy. I mean, the, the challenge you have in talking about war, I can talk about this differently with soldiers and units and people that have been to war, um, is that it's the same, my point is it's the same moral principles. If it involves one human being killing and doing something that kills another human being, as, it as just should be the major, same though? moral principles, the same moral calculus that goes through. And right, it should be as, a high burden. As a burden. philosophy major, I'm sure you're aware of the numerous faults in the, the whole eye for an eye, lex talionis uh, retribution argument. That it's fraught with... Right. My, my argument has nothing to do with retribution. Yeah. I oppose the death penalty. 
The, the problem is not just that there are many more cases than we imagine in which the individual uh, analogy can, can be played out uh, in the way that this one was uh, without shooting somebody. The problem is that when you get rid of the analogy and you talk about war, and it's not this immediacy and this urgency, although they always try to sell it as something urgent, uh, it's always possible to do without killing masses of people, always. There's never been a case, and there never could be a case, when you couldn't find a better solution. And, and if we were to move the world in the direction of planning for better solutions and put resources into that, uh, we would be so much better off. But you know, one reason why the whole idea of there is such thing as war defensism, um, I think Norman, a British guy, is, is a big fan of it, that we should only have defensive weapons, like the Maginot Line, right? And the problem is when Nazi Germany invaded France, all they had is a defensive system. And you, defensive systems will always be beaten by offensive systems. It, you know, you have to be able to counterattack. You have to do something more than have a defense. And so I'm all for, we should never be on the strategic offense in a war. We should never be the aggressor. But we will not defend the people that need defending if you don't have some offensive capability. A purely defensive weapon is going to be immobile, and it's going to be yeah. too easily defeated. It's, it's self-nominating, and the people don't appreciate it, uh, and it's counterproductive. Why don't other countries need to spend a trillion dollars a year to defend themselves? Because when you do defend yourself in that way, you actually endanger yourself. You actually create more enemies than you're able to murder or deter. Yeah, we uh, agree. The defense budget is too big, the defense military industrial complex is too big, and that we're involved in some dumb wars. That wasn't our question. That was part of the part we agreed on. The difference is you're saying it's never justified to, for any country to defend itself against an attack. I, go mm -hmm. talk to the people in Ukraine. I'm saying there are better ways to defend yourself against an attack. I'm saying don't go and institute a coup in Ukraine. Don't go and stir up this trouble. Don't go and spend three years backing a Ugandan war against Rwanda and then support the very likely assassinator of the president of Rwanda and then support taking that war into Congo and slaughtering many, many times more people than nobody ever says, not another Congo, and then claim, well, since we were, you know, not involved and something bad was happening in Rwanda, we should have bombed some people. The United States is already pre-involved everywhere. It's not a passerby. It's not a good Samaritan. You can't occupy Iraq and be an innocent passerby and do good. You've already created the problem. Now, the defense of our political community should always be a public act. We should know what's going on. And it's only the last, since Vietnam, that our CIA, an intelligence agency, has taken on a military violent role we should absolutely get rid of that. Anytime people kill on behalf of the American people, we should all know that it's going on and have approved of, of it. So, yeah, that CIA <laughs> stuff is it, terrible. It, if we had a... Our, uh, we we okay. ended 9 o'clock. We <laughs> all right, let's... So we'll limit let's two minutes. Over here, I think you're... All right, so my question was for you. Um, oh, your police analogy. Okay, this is... But, um, so we've seen the past, like, five years a lot of problems with um, excessive police violence. And you kind of, if I'm not wrong, made a parallel between police officers and war, how they kind of keep the peace or um, not necessarily punish those who get out of line, but something similar. Um, do you you protect the innocent. You use yeah, force okay. as necessary to eliminate threats. Okay. Yeah, our police, I think 98% of our police are good. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen cases where police use excessive force. The key is we all recognize it as excessive. There's a, so much data on that, it's absurd. But yeah. um, so for that parallel, like, isn't the magnitude of war when it gets out of hand so much greater than when police officers get out of hand? So I'm wondering if it's an efficient method of um, using force to, when necessary. Well, that's the point. If it's necessary, it means there's no other way to end the threat. Okay. If it's not necessary, then we should be doing those other things. Okay. And a lot of times, to have the threat of force allows you to negotiate and do other things. Mm -hmm. If they know that they're going to win if it comes to fighting, then the, the enemy has no incentive to uh, negotiate in good faith. 
So ideally, your military force is strong enough to protect you against any attack, um, but you never have to use it. Just like police. I know a lot of police I know are proud that they never had to fire their weapon over their entire career. They probably accomplished a whole lot of good. But it's not just like police. Police target individuals for specific reasons. They're trained to try to use nonviolence first to de-escalate the situation. And the end result is supposed to be a trial in a court. So when you talk about murdering people with missiles from drones as if it's some sort of law enforcement, of people in most cases not identified, of people not charged with any crime, of, of people in many cases who clearly could have been arrested and charged with a crime and tried, uh, it's, it's an abuse of language. It's not policing, it's committing crimes. But a just war isn't the drone war. You'd probably feel good to know at West Point, a couple times on our term and exams, we've used the example of drone war and overwhelmingly, uh, and this is after a whole semester of people studying the ethics of war, um, disapprove, think it's wrong. So just because something in, yeah. that we're doing in war is morally unjustifiable, yeah, it's exactly okay, we can the, agree on that. It's exactly we, the we, same But we can a still pilot. fight just wars without using drones or use them no. justly. No. All right, I had another quick question. No. Sorry, just, this one's very we're short. Okay. We'll see you afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I, this is half a question, and, and I hope I, I'm not, again, I'm not totally sure I understood you, Pete, but. I'll give you half How up. could it ever, but actually the question is for both of you. How could you, your question to the, as I understood it, how could it ever be wrong to use force against genocide? And so the thing that immediately came to mind was the Rohingya. What do we do? Can we do anything? I don't know enough about the specifics of it. I've only seen what's in the mass media, which I've learned not to trust too much. Um, and so I, I won't offer an opinion. Sounds bad, though. The, the US military would be of no help, would be counterproductive. Uh, and if there were oil there and we were facing uh, the proposal of the US military uh, helping out, uh, we would need to do everything we could to oppose it, uh, which you know takes one out of the million things that we could be doing. Uh, of course there is hope, but there's not hope in enacting a policy that would be counterproductive and make matters even worse. Okay, one more. Oh, God bless you. I don't know if this is a question or not, but when you brought up police and then you brought it up again, um, I just wanted to share, I worked inner city Chicago, 1958, and I was trying to explain to a little boy that the policemen are our friends. Miss Phyllis, policeman, he ain't my friend. I'm just running the store for my mama. I ain't done nothing. He pushed me up against the wall. I ain't done nothing. And then... So he's experienced bad police officers. Yeah, 1950. Unjust police officers. Yeah, and then um, it was always um, interesting to me. I led groups into inner city Chicago for years and years, 20 plus. And in these black community where we were, there were only, only, only white policemen. And I just thought that was just so insensitive. And the last time I was there a year ago, there were some black police people and I mentioned it to the people in the community and they said, yeah, we're really happy with this. But if I'd had able to use a gun, I would have loved to have been a police person in that community or even here. But um, I, I think we have to realize that our police have also got a long way to come when it comes to um, the conflicts that we experience, yeah, uh, that I we agree. read about. What, what I like is that we can recognize just and unjust use of police force. Yeah. We, we see that, and I think we can make the same judgments about our nation. Mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive to the police thing. Yes, I had a brother who's a police, deputy police chief, but when I was, so I'm a West Point cadet, my sister's getting married, they're going to do their uh, bachelorette party. She says, you're pretty safe. You can drive us. Um, and I'm down in Washington, D.C., and twice a guy comes up, tries to sell me some drugs. So I'm like, no, man, I don't want any of that. And I see a police officer. I'm like, hey, that guy over there is trying to sell me some drug named this. And he's like, really? He walks over that guy. I'm thinking he's going to talk to him and arrest him. Pulls out his club and beats the snot out of him. I just, I was sick. Okay. I was like, oh, my God, I did, you know, I'm implicated in that. I yeah. wish now I had done something to turn them in. So I know police officers aren't good. Yeah. That's just like, not everyone can handle the responsibility of power. That's and so true. those who are entrusted with power as police officers, as soldiers, should be held to a very high standard yes. of using that power, that violence responsibly and in a way that makes us proud. Thank you. Okay, I think we've uh, had a wonderful debate and a wonderful Final evening, word. very educational.
Were there going to be final remarks or no? Uh, well, it's 9 o'clock. Uh, um, uh, well, do you want to have a final word? Because I just had a final word. Well, you can have I, I would conclude that, uh, uh, in, a, in large agreement that the power to destroy the earth with fire and fury uh, at the drop of a button should not be entrusted to anyone, anybody. Nobody should have that. Uh, and if we did have a referendum, as was almost enacted in the 1930s before any war, we wouldn't have any wars. Uh, if we had democracy instead of wars to spread democracy, we wouldn't have wars. Yeah, I, I love to believe that's true, except they're always popular when they start uh, with a whole lot of support. What soldiers worry about is when they, you get us into silly wars, aren't committed as a nation to do it, and then we're stuck with fighting it when the popularity goes away. Don't so, go. We had so a gentleman thanks. here who did the right thing. You well, don't so go. Let's, let's have a big round of applause you, for our See you tomorrow night. Oh, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. So we'll stay, um, I'll stay around if anyone wants to talk anymore. Uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to drop the screen and have another vote right now. So uh, please uh, take care of that uh, uh, before you go. <laughs> Very glad awesome. to. Very glad to. Thank you.